Bayeru Jane, Director of Communication, ICT, Press and National Assembly. The keynote speaker will be Honorable Sirif Abbasanyan, who is ably represented by um, the Director of Community Development, Amit Jaju, sorry, Fatu Jiba, sorry about that. And the panelists for today's program will be Ms. Mam Yasin Sar, founder and C CEO, Staffis International, and MSDG Diaspora Fellow. Next, we have Ms. Ami Fatu Jalo, Aji Fatu Jalo, General Manager, Jigora Trading, and MSDG Fellow as well. Next to Aji Fatu, we have Imam Ba Kalilu JT, founder, Imam JT Charity Foundation. Next, we have Honorable Sidi Ajata, a veteran politician and a former National Assembly member. Can we now call on the moderator, Jibairu, to lead this workshop of SNF 6? Thank you very much, Dumbe. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you to the first workshop for today, and which is extremely very important to the work that each and every one of us do in moving the Republic of the Gambia forward. This afternoon, we will be looking at the Diaspora Development Fund. This fund, part of the Gambia Diaspora Strategy, and incorporated in the National Development Plan, pursued by GK Partners and the MSDG Project, is to ensure support for national organizations to be able to deliver to the Gambian people. From inception, um, in 2021 alone, the Diaspora Development Fund generated some $50 million. And this year, 2022-2023, they are looking at over $130 um, million. This shows how significant the Diaspora is where we have over a quarter of a million of our citizens creating partnership for impact. And that is what society needs. This afternoon, I am very delighted to be joined by very distinguished personalities of the country. People who, who are in the service of others. They are ensuring that they are not only living for themselves, but their life only has meaning when they are impacting on the life of other people. Therefore, allow me to introduce, and you give a round of applause as I introduce my panelists. We have Ms. Mam Yasin Sar. Founder and CEO of Staffis International. And she is equally an MSDG Diaspora Fellow. We have Ms. Ajifatu Jalo. She is the general man manager of. Um, Get a trading and equally an MSDG diaspora fellow. I will not go into the work they do. The mere fact that they are MSDG diaspora fellows speaks volumes of their contribution to the development of the Gambian society. 
we have Imam Bakali Lujaide. And he is the founder of the Imam Jaite Charitable Foundation. Yeah, Imam, you are welcome. <laughs> of course, my own boss, um, it's always fascinating um, to be on the same table with your boss, Ms. Fatu Jiba, veteran administrator and director of community development. I have two bosses, by the way, um, but these bosses have breaks, eh? so we will be safe throughout the journey. Of course, Honorable Sidia Jata is no stranger to Gambians. Founding member of the People's Democratic Organization for Independence and Socialism, and a veteran National Assembly member and educationist. Honorable Jata, you are welcome. Thank you very much, police ban. Without much ado, I will first allow the panelists to share ideas on how we leverage the diaspora. How do we build partnerships for impact? And of course, the youths are always in the vanguard. And this afternoon, we will start with a youth. And it's my pleasure to invite Miss Mam Yasin Sar. We apologize for that. Um, we will have a slight adjustment um, in the proceedings. And uh, instead of starting with Mam Yasin Sar, we will be starting with uh, Ms. Jifatu Jalo, the general manager of um, Gira Trading and as well as an MSDG fellow. Thank you. Jalo. Thank you. Oh, yes. Honorable ministers, honorable National Assembly members, distinguished guests, thank you for joining us today. My name is Ajifatu Jalo, and I am a Diaspora Development Fund um, Fellow for the 2022-23 financial year. I came back to Gambia in 2019. I was living in Dubai, and I came back home because I wanted to work in Gambia and share my knowledge and contribute to national development. When I came here, I was part of a company that worked in logistics and procurement in the hospitality industry. This was in 2020, 2019. We worked for about two years and worked with the major hospitality industry players such as Tamala Hotel, BB Hotel, Bungalow Beach, um, Balafong, Ocean Bay, and the like. But as you all know, at the end of 2019, something terrible happened in that industry, the COVID pandemic. When that happened, I automatically lost my job because now our biggest clients don't have enough money to source new products anymore. 
I became a little bit tense and I was like, now I have to work in something really sustainable, so I guarantee I have a job in the future. Then I saw that the uh, Gambia Chamber of Commerce had a challenge for young entrepreneurs. And I was like, let me try my luck and apply and see where this will take me. So I had, a, I had an idea. My idea was based on a solar cold room and we'll be using air conditioners to power the cold room. I, su I submitted my application and I became a finalist. So that was a very big confidence boost, and I was like, maybe this is a good direction for me to take. Thereafter, I did some research, and I found out that the KMC actually has a coal storage in the Serakunda market that is solar powered. I was like, wow, this is fantastic. Let me see if I can talk to them, and maybe hopefully they will let me run it. And they did let me run it, and they gave me a three-year lease. So. KMC is a beneficial partner to me, and I am thanking them for giving me this opportunity. But when they gave me the call storage, I realized that I had a lot of renovations to do. I had to make it more efficient, and I had to improve the capacity. But also, being a very price uh, sensitive market that I'm dealing with, which is the women traders in the market, I had to find a way to make it accessible to them because it was donated to them. But as we all know, cold storage is mainly geared to the wholesalers, the hotels, the restaurants, and the bigger player in the industry. My goal was to try and figure out how do you make sure that the, the masses, the, the Gambian women that are working in this market can have access to these facilities in a way that is also, um, it's uh, with price sensitivity in mind, and um, access to provision as well. So I decided that I will use the air, condition, uh, air conditioners in the cold room, but I'll upgrade them. I'll basically hack them to operate as cooling systems. And um, I am using this technology called a cool bot. A cool bot is basically a thermostat that can basically turn any cooler, any air conditioner into a commercial cooler. And I figured, if I can do this, then I can still use the solar um, that was provided when they donated the cold storage to KMC, which will make my uh, my provision my uh, which will make my services cheaper to the clientele that I'm serving because we know that the electricity rates in Gambia is very high, and this really affects the service provision and the quality that we can give to the people working in the market. So then I applied to the Diaspora Development Fund because I really did need funding to help me renovate my project. I applied to them and then I won, I guess, one of the spots for the 2022-2023 year. It was a big confidence boost for me because it was a very lonely journey until then. And I'm very grateful for their opportunity, for their support, for noticing that I am a young Gambian and I'm trying my best to make this work. And they understand my vision and they're helping me out. So my goal is to, what I do tell my friends, especially the ones that are coming back is, sometimes you don't have to create new businesses. We can look at projects that are here and help them make them better. It is not the government's role to actually make sure that, well, it is their role to help us, but it is our role to also help them make sure that these projects that are meant for us also benefit us, right? My experience in logistics and supply chain was very helpful in thinking about how to provide solutions to the cold storage project and how to bring accessibility to the Gambian women. We will be the cheapest operating cold storage when we start in about a month. We'll be charging $10 per basket for the average woman. And for the vegetables, it's, it's going to be $10. And for the fruit, it will be $15. This is the cheapest, um, uh, this is the cheapest energy uh, cold storage rate you'll find anywhere in West Africa and in the Gambia. And we are very grateful for that. And thank you, DDF, for your support. We are very grateful. My, what I, I guess what I'll add to this conversation is for the government to help optimize the regulatory environment for young businesses such as me, such as mine, help us with better policy to make us more comfortable in this business. We know that some, there's a lot of barriers to entry 
in business in Gambia, especially financing. Maybe some people don't even have the literacy needed to um, uh, to access the the loans or the grants that are available. I hope that the government can help young Gambians with ideas to help grow those ideas and also improve them to serve the better to serve everybody in Gambia for the better. Thank you very much. I think we are just from having lunch. So see this serves a louder round of applause than that. <laughs> Thank you. She has given us an inspirational story that when you are down, you can lift up. And she has gone from being jobless to providing a service to one of the most critical sectors of our society and our economy in particular, our women and their small-scale businesses. But to make assurances double sure, we would like to give you a short video of what, Ma, um, of what Fatu just talked about and how she is going about it. Thank you. Control room, can we have the video, please? No, that's Mami Asin. Sorry. That is Mami Asin.
Thank you, control room. Um, actually, that was um, the message from our supposed first speaker, Mam Yasin Sar. Now we will want to look into the issue of how every sector of society can contribute to growth, to progress, to national development. Oftentimes, imams are known to be selling the words of scripture, telling us about messages of God and his apostles. Extraordinary imams go beyond spreading the message of God to discovering their mission and fulfilling their mission. One of such imam is Bakali Lujaiti with his charitable foundation. We will want him to share with us how do we leverage on his job as an imam and building partnerships to create impact, particularly through the Diaspora Development Fund. Yeah, Imam, thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu. First of all, I will say that my English is not that much strong. Imam is an Arabic scholar. But alhamdulillah, Imam is fluent in English, Spanish, Arabic, and French. Hablo español más claro que leche. Que voy a saludar todos que estás aquí. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuhu. Ahlan wa sahlan wa marhaban. First of all, I would like to congratulate myself and congratulate my brother, the founder of this initiative, Professor Jibril Fall, who happened to be a colleague in UK. It is very sad. You were born in Gambia. Educate in Gambia. You have friends, family members. You left Gambia for greener pasture. It is very sad, my fellow brothers and fellow sisters. Sometimes you become teary when your fellow brothers and sisters made a phone call to you. We need a medical support. We need an assistance. The conditions that you are in that moment, they don't know. You struggling to pay your bills, struggling to accommodate yourself. But those living in this country think that all that glitter is a goal. May Allah make it easy with us. We've lost the value of the family in this country. We lose our friendship. We lose the indigenous of these countries. My brother is very sad to be living in diaspora. For past 30 years, we frequently come to this country, but mainly we are in diaspora. May Allah make it easy and a taxful journey for all of us to come back, to contribute meaningfully towards the development of this country. Imam Jaita Charitable Foundation was founded by Imam Jaita himself in 2013. I have come to this country. I saw some of the boys brewing attire all over. Uh, do you have a amulo pound, Madam Jende attire? I said, this is not going to move the country forward. What can we do? Let us put our hand on deck and help our fellow boys. I called some of the members of the communities that from CRR. I said, I want to set up a medical caravan. You guys with a medical background, we can extend our hands to poor and needy people back home. You are eye specialists, nurse, etc., and etc. 50,000 is here. Go and buy medic medicines. We started from Jarome Koto. 
Every three months, from Jaru Mekoto, we went on Jen Sanjal. From Jen Sanjal, we went to Basse. So I flopped the money, maybe 50,000, 100,000, 150,000. We need what we, we buy what we need. So we go and see the people that don't have facilities for the primary health care system in this country. Alhamdulillah, the initiative, the initiative is going well. We are an Arabic scholars. Some of our great fathers got a mentality that if you happen to be an English scholar, you definitely will not fit into the society of our cultural systems. So the initiation have started. We have madrasas. We transform the madrasas into English and Arabic schools. Kauru, Jarome Koto, Kuntauru, and other places. Each of the places, we have over 350 students with full scholarships from the Imam Jaita Charitable Foundation. Then there was a time I came to this country in Ramadan. Price are skyrocketing. I said, what can I do? I went to the up countries, the places that I met. There is no well, no borehole, nothing absolutely. They rely on the donkeys and the horse to go to the riverside up to the George town from the Jamali village. I think from Jamali to George town is seven or eight kilometers to go and fetch the water to come and do their daily services. I said, my goodness, I have to get a clean water facility for them. Allah help us, we have done that. In every Ramadan, Imam Jaita Charitable Foundation extend a help to the poor and needy, not in the urban area, but the rural areas. Last year, we have spent over $500,000 in one village. Our budget estimation was 2.5 million, but Allah help us, we have spent over 3 million in this country in Ramadan alone. And then we have a serious problem in this country. Wherever you turn, left and right, Quran is memorization centers. But after that, how are we going to feed them into the societies? I remember in 1988, African Muslim, Kuwaiti African Muslim Charitable Foundation, the founder, Mufti Alauddin, I went to help him to help me for scholarships. He told me that, but how can I help you a scholarship? You are not enrolled into any schools. You come from Dara. So we can't give scholarships like that. Fellow Gambians, we have a serious problems. Quranic memorization is very good. But after memorizing the Quran, how are we going to adopt them into the society? This is a serious problem. You go and memorize Quran in three years. You go and memorize Quran five years. You come and sit down. Is that is going to give you a, 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 something that to put on your mouth? It is very difficult. This country happened to be an English-speaking country. How could you come with your book, with that certificate said that you know, you're going to develop the country? You will be left behind. And then, Imam, as an Imam, if I wake up in the morning in the UK, I don't have schedule for myself. My schedule is for Gambian communities. Sometimes I'll have 10, 20 messages on my phone. My father died up. My mother died. I have an amen ceremony. I have a family issue. So you have to distribute your time for the communities. Imam have done over 3,000 naming ceremonies alone in the UK. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, we have a very good communities. And then we are working hand in glove. But there is a serious problem in this country, which the organization really want to embark on that, if Allah help us. 
Under the new purpose of the beneficial, funeral home is not exist in Gambia, which is very sad. If you happen to have a problem to repatriate the body in this country, the first things that you think, you know, where am I going to keep the body before the burial? Or when they call you your brother or your in-law, your father or your loved one have passed away, each and everybody really want to come and gather in your place. The first thing that you need to have, you, 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 you will think of, you will think of, you know, how am I going to feed all these people? In spite of significant importance of the mutuaries in the life of the Gambian, there is a limited access to this facility. The main mutuary called Dead House is part of the Edward Francis Small Teaching Hospital. Infrastructure in Banjul, it is the oldest facility and it's used by both Muslim and Christians to prepare their dead for burial or for a repatriation. The dead house is also double as a mode, holding the place for unclaimed corpse and for cases under review or investigation. Those causing congestion in the recent past, some hospitals and mosques also have mortuaries. Funeral homes are non exist in the Gambia. This is our main target. If I happen to have a location, a strategic location, I definitely want to build a magnificent place whereby both the Muslim and the Christians, we could store 100 bodies in that place. And if you have a burial, you don't need to worry that my house is small. If it is Serekunda, they say 2 o'clock we're going to do the burial. The place we have three different halls. This place will take 2,000 people. This place will take 1,000. This place will take 500 people. Now from 1 o'clock, come and get prepared. The place is available for you from 1 o'clock to 2.30. Those are coming to use the service for 5 o'clock. The place is available for you from 3 o'clock up to 5.30. Those are doing the burial for Maghrib time. The place is available for you from 5.30 to 7.30. These are our initiatives. And we have to moderate our systems. Inshallah, Allah, if Allah help us, we need to teach the Arabic scholars and impress them how to fit them in this society. Memorization of Quran, memorization of Quran, you finish, you go and say, you put in an ideology into this society. If we not really careful, we will lose the core value of our culture. And we are going to embrace other culture, which is going to bring Lot of conflict in this country. May Allah help us, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Imam. I think we have now seen the power, the value, when theology is combined with humanism. Imam, once again, thank you very much. Thank you, too. And Imam talked about community support systems, social support networks, existing infrastructure. And the very person who sits in the heart of decision making of all of that is no other than our able director of community development. How do we improve diaspora involvement, particularly within communities? I therefore invite Ms. Fatu Thank you, moderator. Good afternoon, honorable ministers. Good afternoon, Professor Jibril Fal, the GK partners, and the MSGD project management team. I have my honorable governor's representatives here equally the chairpersons of the local government authorities are here with us, colleagues from the diaspora. Good morning, 
to you. Um, good afternoon to all of you. First of all, I want to take the opportunity to apologize on behalf of my Honorable Minister of Lands, Regional Government and Religious Affairs for being unable to be with us here as he is currently out of the country. I extend his warmest appreciation for the invitation and apologize, but spiritually, he is here with us. Um, I want to talk about a project that the Department of Community Development, as a government department under the Ministry of Lands, is implementing in this country to showcase the mechanism that we are using to reach the poorest of the poor, the vulnerable population across the country. Currently, this program or project is implemented in the North Bank region of the country in eight of the wards. We work with local government authorities, hand in glove, to identify these wards. Equally, in the CRR North, that's the Kuntawur Area Council, the CRR South under the Janjaburi Area Council and the Lower River Regions. These are countries chosen to implement this program. The name of the program or project is the Job, Skills and Finance Program for Women and Youth in the Gambia. It's a four-year program or project uh, with a cost of 15.2 million euros supported by the European Union, but implemented through the United Nations Capital Development Fund. As a department under the ministry, we are the implementing agency for this project. There is an agreement, a letter of agreement signed in 2018, since that was the launch of the program with the UNCDF to serve as the implementing agency for this project. As you all know, most of you in the Gambia and in the development arena, the Department of Community Development has regional offices as well as extension services that covers the length and breadth of this country at the lowest level in each of these wards or almost uh, all in each of the wards. The main goal of this project is to contribute to stabilizing the economy, social and security situation during the democratic transition by facilitating a social inclusion and employment of youth and women with specific emphasis on promoting gender equality and addressing climate change. I know during the mo in the morning session we had the previous speakers talking about the transition period from uh, an authoritarian to a democratic uh, regime. So during this project process, that was when we designed this project to address some of the challenges the country is facing. Equally, it is designed to contribute to job creation for youth, women, and the local communities. We develop skills and improve access to finance for these poor women and youth in the communities. The program objective, the specific, is to increase employability and most vulnerable, with, for the most vulnerable groups of our society with emphasis, like I said, on youth and women in this country with mm -hmm. emphasis on green and climate resilient economy. The mechanism that I want to share with this August body is a special one that we call the local. Local means local climate adaptive living facility. It's a mechanism, a new one for that matter, which really promotes decentralization as well as strengthening the local governance system in this country. Through this mechanism, we provide a country-based mechanism to integrate climate change adaptation into local government planning and budgeting system 
in a participatory and gender-sensitive manner and increase the amount of finance available to local governments for climate change adaptation. We all know the local government authorities have limited resource base to be able to address the needs of the poor people who are taxpayers in their various regions. As a government, as development partners, we need to support them to be able to answer to the needs of the poor. So this is why they are our key partners in this whole project implementation. It equally combines a performance-based climate resilient grant with technical and capacity building support. The project gives money to world development committees. The elected councillors are the chair of these committees in their various wards. The department with other stakeholders in the regions or the world take these communities or committees through a participatory planning process where projects are identified as their need, felt needs equally prioritized in that important manner as, uh, as, as a word and through that funds are transmitted directly into their accounts. We do again encourage the partnership with other microfinance institutions in this country. We don't handle cash. Funds are transferred from the Central Bank of the Gambia to their various wards equally the cash for work beneficiaries. Each project, there is a component of 35% of the funds which should go to cash for work beneficiaries so that we build or develop the local economy, create jobs for women and youth. So we work with service providers like the Reliance, the Q Money, so that they pay open accounts for each of the participants in the cash for work beneficiary category and then their wages are transferred to their accounts. Equally, it is anchored as a project on the then National Development Plan and the National Climate Change Policy of the government of the Gambia. Its broad objective, like I said, is to, make, is to reduce poverty through improving inclusion and sustainable growth and employment targeting mainly the youth of this country and women in particular. The key outcomes that we expect out of this project is for a sustainable and equal opportunities created for youth and women. Currently, what we do as a department is to help build the capacity of these world committees. We all know if we go to the rural communities now, it's very difficult to find, uh, I don't know how to use the word, literate people who will be able to really take note of all what they do as a committee. So we build their capacity in terms of financial management, procurement processes. This is usually carried out by the Accountant General's Department as a partner. Equally, the Gambia Public Pro uh, Procurement uh, Corporation or authority is mandated to do the training or capacity building in terms of helping them know the procurement procedures in this country as we have minimum conditions that these communities or committees should meet as well as performance uh, conditions or performance measures that they should really meet before they can qualify for their second, third cycles in the project. So capacity building is one of the key outputs that we continuously do. Equally, we prepare the preparation of development plans. We cannot just live or work in a vacuum like that. The world development committees are encouraged to come up with a four or five year development plan and with a budget that focuses how many jobs do they want to create in terms of equally putting into consideration the gender equality and green and climate resilient local economy. So the projects that they will be identifying should be reflecting climate change adaptation 
building the resilience of these people or communities or communities that are beneficiaries. The delivery of the mechanism is through, like I said, cast for work program and procurement to local SMEs in the regions or the wards, employment of youth and women. We encourage them if projects require the service of a contractor to source it within the world where they live. If not available, we encourage them to look in the regions before going out of the whole region. Equally, it is designed and imp implemented on a performance base, like I said, using this uh, local mechanism. And currently, like I said, in year one of the program, Mansakonko Area Council or the Lower River Region, we are implementing the program in eight wards, which equivalents for the first year, $90,000. Uh, the Kerewan Area Council equally benefited from a total of $90,000. The second year, this program, like I said, was piloted in North Bank and Elara. So in the first cycle, these are the two regions that benefited. Along the line, we uh, replicated the idea into the other regions. So second year, a total of 20 wards benefited. In LRR, we had $180,000 disbursed or used as project funds in these regions. Kerwan Area Council, the same funds, and then Janjambure equally coming in as in the second year, benefited from 45,000, and the list goes on. So we have on an annual basis uh, other wards that are increased in the number or to, onto the existing wards that we are operating in. So as we speak, we are in 32 wards of this country, that is the regions of the North Bank, eight in North Bank, eight in LRR, eight in Sierra North and South. We create temporal jobs, like I said, for youth and women. In 2020, 1,406 jobs were created. In 2022, 2,625 jobs were created through the payment of cash for work beneficiaries who do or provide the labor, both in terms of skilled laborers and unskilled laborers within the communities that we have this project. We are encouraging local economic development, not allowing contractors to hire people from Banjul or Serekunda to go and implement, but the community the beneficiaries themselves would work and earn a living through this program. We are equally upscaling, and then the uh, proposals we are anticipating, like I said, is for a government of the Gambia to equally contribute to the adaptation fund, at least 10% of the adaptation fund, and we are glad to announce that there is a budget line created in this 2023 uh, budget for this purpose. Additional funding is required from the diaspora, the MSDD project, so that together we can reach out to the poor people and help them in getting jobs, creating skills for them, and then equally uh, uh, benefiting from whatever the project comes for them. Equally, we are looking up to going into the 88 wards remaining. We have 120 wards in the country. But as I said, it's only in 32 wards. So our wish is to uh, replicate the same project into the other regions or wards of this country. On that note, I want to thank everyone for their support. Equally, the GK partners have supported the Department of Community Development. Uh, the training institution under the department that is called the Rural Development Institute, located in Mansa, Congo, has benefited from a support of the, from this uh, MSGD project. And we want to thank Professor Fala and team and 
hope that the partnership will still continue. We are a partner and we will continue to be partnering with you in all your endeavors. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, our able director of the Department of Community Development for that explicit expose of how much you've gone to ensure that our communities acquire skills and services. You've talked about ensuring sustainability. And I want to move this question to Honorable Sidia Jada. How do we ensure a sustainable socio-economic development through linking the diaspora with national organizations? And what investment opportunities exist? Honorable Jada, welcome. Good afternoon. I hate making mistakes where they can be avoided. So I say good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. All of the protocols sincerely observed. It was yesterday, just yesterday, they phoned me and told me about this forum. There are thousand and one things that were can be said about the DDF. But I'm going to leave that for the moment and talk about what is crucially important as far as I am I'm concerned. During break, I sarcastically said to Professor and said, you have generated so much money, 136 million, 2.25 million euros. But you are not Gambians. No, it's, 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 it's important, it's very serious. He laughed, but he understood what I meant. Yes, they are not Gambians. Because they have no say in the management of the affairs of this republic. And that is what we should be talking about. Non-Gambians committedly generated $136 million for investment in view of development in its diverse forms in this country, but they have no say in this country. What do I mean by they have no say in this country? I know some of them, some of you understand what I'm saying. There are over 200,000 Gambians outside this country who are contributing committedly to the development of this country, but they have no say as to how the affairs of this country are managed. They are disenfranchised. Like we in the protectorate were disenfranchised until 1960. Elections were being held in this country up to 1960, but people outside the urban area, Banjul and its environs were not empowered to vote. That was colonial. But the same thing is being repeated in a republic where we are all equal, according to our fundamental law. But that equality is not giving any practical expression. And we are all quiet about that. But we are happy when these diasporans send us $136 million, we clap. But we forget that these are people who have no say in the affairs of this republic. What do we do to bring that to an end? For me, that is the issue. I can say a thousand things about DDF. In fact, I have noted something I'm going to discuss with them with regard to what can be done with the DDF. 
but I'm not going to talk about that here. What I'm concerned about is these people are Gambians, and they must be recognized as such by giving them what you have and they don't have. We know it, but we are all quiet about it. This is the, this is the strangeness about this republic. We see something fundamentally wrong. We all know it, and we fold our hands. We say nothing about As long as it does not affect us directly, we are not concerned. <laughs> My dear compatriots, it is time we change it. It is time we became a real republic. We should stop being republic in name. We should be a republic in practice and in deed. These people have a right to vote in this country. The law says, the law says, every Gambian section 26 of our constitution is very clear. Every Gambian of age has a right to vote and to be voted for. All these people who are generating this fantastic sum of money are above 18 years. So why are we not allowing them to vote? And they are doing more than what some of us here are doing for this country. Even though we have a right to say who should be our president, who should be our member of parliament, who should be this, who should be that. But they don't have. And yet, they are still very committed to work hard to see that this country is free from poverty, is free from ignorance, is free from injustices. But that injustice is being meted on them. So, they are asking for changes which are very simple. Section 71, subsection 2. If you, are a, if you have a dual citizenship, you cannot be employed as a minister. Okay, fine. This is Gambia. They just see little things. They, lift, they refuse to look at things globally. Do you want to tell me that there are not Gambians who are working in the system in the Gambia, either as civil servants or as security agents who have dual citizenship? I know somebody who had worked in the security service. He had dual citizenship. The issue of duality is boiling down to one thing, security. Avoiding you have dual allegiance. But what about a security person who has dual citizenship and is working in that sector? No question about that. And even an ordinary civil servant who is working in the civil service, uh, service and has dual citizenship, you are not worried about that? What, make, what difference does it make with a minister? What difference does it make? Same for section 90, subsection 1. Same, dual citizenship. You cannot be a member of national citizen, national, national assembly. <laughs> But when I bring one million dollars, it's 2.5, million euros. No qualms are raised about me not being a Gambian in that respect. Well, I'm not going to take much of your time. I just want to raise these issues for all of you to know. I have been working with these people for years on this issue. At the back of your program paper document, you will see the issues raised there. We have been working on them for years, to no avail. But the, there will be. There has to be. Because what, that's what the law says. 
It is only this country whose citizens, when they are outside the Gambia, don't vote. You know, Senegalese, when they have elections, they, they vote here. Guineans, they vote here. Others, they vote here. But ours, in Senegal and elsewhere, they don't vote. Because we don't see them as Gambians, with the same right as we who are in this republic. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I think what I have said is enough for you to go and think about. It is our collective responsibility to see that what the law says is implemented in our common interest. Anybody who is denied of what we have, it is our duty to make sure that person also enjoys what we are enjoying. If you don't, then we are bad citizens. Thank you very much. Forty years in the service of the nation, each time he speaks, the vision, the idea, the agenda becomes much clearer. He has challenged us to move away from the outward trappings of a republic and build a republic in its true sense. And in doing that, we have to fight against injustice ensure that all citizens of the Republic are equal and free. Not my words, the words of Honorable Sidia Jata. Can we give the panel another round of applause? This is what forums of this nature, where people with caliber, with sound minds, this cause achieve. Because after all, development is about ideas. And on that note, I wish to apologize that we will be unable to take questions for the panel due to limitations in time. But the organizers have happily informed me that the Badibunkas don't need to complain anymore. The lunch is served, and from this point we will break for lunch and come back exactly one hour time. Meaning exactly at um, 15.30, we should be back in this hall, and there will be another workshop this time around with the right honorable minister for trade. And it will also symbolize the launching of the Gaipa Diaspora Advisory Desk. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, and my distinguished panelists, it is a pleasure being with you, and we hope we will continue this conversation further. Thank you all very much. Yes, thank you.